And often my mother used to tell me, you go for it. You can do anything you want to be in life. And I have her to thank for who I am as a creative person. And yet often when people come up to me and say, so what is it that you do? And I say, well, I'm an artist. I always have this tightness in my chest because I know what's coming next, right? We all do. So what exactly is it that you do? <laughs> And it really disturbs me because I don't know how to answer it except to start with what it is that I know to show them that I can do. spoke to you for even a moment, I begin to do my job. But the problem is that it's always gnawed at me because it doesn't feel like it's enough. It doesn't feel deep enough. It doesn't feel like when you leave this room, you're going to remember this for more than five minutes. And to me, it feels like you need to remember it forever and that I need to open your hearts and minds forever because I think that's what an artist is supposed to do. But what exactly is a 21st century artist supposed to do? I've thought about this for a long time. And for me to be able to talk about it, I need to go back to the beginning. Because we were all here born in the 20th century, weren't we? And in the beginning of the 21st century, we have the automobile industry to thank for how we began. It was the old car company that created the assembly line. And it was the Model T and Henry Ford that created mass production. And for mass production, we went into interchangeable parts. We're all cogs in a wheel, right? Any one of us can be replaced at any one time. Because after all, standardization was part of what the 20th century represented. And lo and behold, we had the Great Depression and two wars. And in the 50s, what happened? Disneyland. <laughs> and Elvis gyrated on the Ed Sullivan show. And Dr. Seuss exploded with Cat in the Hat in the 50s. And we had our first Peanuts cartoon strip. And in 1964, I was born. And they say that if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> well, I was only six by the end of it. But what happened, and I remember this because my father started talking to me about this in the 70s, because he was a diehard Democrat. And he, he quoted John F. Kennedy. He used to say, Lisa, art is the, is the root of all culture. And society has to free you, Lisa, to do whatever you want to do with your vision. And I was like, rock on, wow, that's really cool. Except there was all this standardization coming around me. The invention of the ethernet and the internet and the personal computer. And then in 1981, I think the groundbreaking book, E-Myth by Michael Gerber, that said sta standardization is the future of business and the future of our world. And I thought, oh my god, I am in deep trouble. Because that isn't at all who I am. I'm like those buttons on that slide. I'm unique. Everyone around me I want to have be unique. I want to be that odd thing. I don't want to be in a box. And the truth of the matter is that I looked around me and I thought, everyone I know has told me that I'm naive and foolish and stupid for pursuing my creativity. I could have been a lawyer. I could have been a doctor. I could have, should have been an accountant. Haven't we all been told that over and over and over again about how smart we are and how stupid we are for pursuing something we love to do? And yet it's kind of hard not to feel stupid when the most creative person you know is your mother, who walked the runway at a size zero and looked like Audrey Hepburn and who went from there to being Miss Candy, and who went from there to being a mom, and who went from there to not knowing what the hell she was supposed to do. Because there wasn't anywhere for her to go. So she became a cook. And her, her cookbooks amassed the, the walls of my house and were ladled with stains of butter and sauce and tomato sauce. And I devoured Behrman scale books while she did it. And then pretty soon, the alcohol turned up next to the nut bag and she became an alcoholic. Because at, in the end of the day, she had no rudder. She had nowhere to take her creativity, nowhere to place it. My mother taught me a lot about what it means to be creative and a lot about what to do and what not to do. 
And the truth of the matter is that we have a problem with society because society sees us as visionaries and rebels and outsiders, and they look to us for their respite and their safe haven. In 1984, I remember being really proud because Amadeus came out and Tom Holtz played, played Mozart. I was like, the Mozart clarinet concerto, great piece, right? And here he is, womanizing and <coughs> flandering around and paying no attention whatsoever. He looked like a buffoon. And on his deathbed, he's writing so that perhaps he can get a few dollars for his family. Oh yes, the starving artist myth is well alive in society. It's their respite. That's how they see us. And let's look at the statistics. Seven out of 10 artists have to have another job. Six out of 10 make less than $40,000 a year. Oh, and did I mention that 33% out of 2.1 million artists make less than 20,000? Think we got a problem? And then came the 21st century. And what was it? <laughs> It's a crash landing into a new age. All of a sudden, we were bookmarked by 9-11 on one side and the worst economic meltdown that we've ever seen in American history. And this is supposed to be the new creative economy. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't you glad you arrived? You can call those years our lost years, the decade from hell, or the deconstruction of the American dream. I don't care which word you use. It was a mess. And I can't think of anyone better to have really clearly exemplified and explained it to us than the painter Thomas Cole, who in 1833 put together the course of empire. And he was inspired by Byron Childs, who, who wrote, um, it was called Harold's Pilgrimage in 1812 through 1818. And I think it's so incredibly fitting and I think it explains the whole story. There is the tale of all, there is the, there is, there is the moral of all human tales. Tis but the same rehearsal of the past. First freedom, then glory. When that fails, wealth, vice, corruption, barbarism at last. And history with all her volumes vast hath but one page. Where do you think we've been? Do you think that maybe, just maybe, with the annihilation of bin Laden, that the barba barbarism phase is over? And if so, are we ready to embrace the creative age? We've got a few little problems to clean up though, don't we? We've got some handcuffs on. What are those handcuffs? Well, if art is the root of all culture, then we exactly were the arts when we had before 9-11. How did we stop that from happening? And if art is the root of all culture, where were we before WorldCom or Enron? And if art is the root of all culture, what about global warming? And what about prisoner number 61727054, Bernie Madoff, who sits rotting in, in, in North Carolina in prison, having committed the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, $51 billion of Ponzi scheme that brought America down to its knees. Well, do you know as a group how much of a labor force we represent? 70 billion but yet we're hardly noticed. What would happen if we just disappeared? Do you think anyone would get it? And what about the fact that we need to clean up our act? What about the fact that there is no room for rudderless artists? That there is no excuse for dysfunction and to falling into the abyss? And what about the fact that we can't put our artwork on sale for half price? Because if we sell out and we say to ourselves that opening people's hearts and minds isn't why we're here, and we say we can just discount that ticket price to be able to get it to do whatever it's supposed to do. What do you think people really feel out there? Do you think they're really getting what it is we're supposed to really be delivering? I don't think so. It's really, it's really concerning to me that we can let this moment in time go by and it's incredibly important that we choose to understand that it is our God-given right to earn a living doing something that we can make a difference at. And that money is not a dirty word. And that you can self-fund ideas like I have been self-funding mine because I make enough money to do that. And I am proud to be able to tell you that I do.
And I want each and every one of you to do the same thing because the only way our voice is ever going to be heard is by us having the tenacity and the capacity and the willingness to do whatever it takes to be heard. So what does it mean to be a 21st century artist? I think that Seth Godin in Lynchman got it right. I think that Jonathan Ive, who created the iPod, is just as much of an artist as Charlie Chaplin. I don't think it has anything to do with the tool. I don't think that my clarinet is symbolic of my artistry. I think it's the hammer. And you know what else I got in my toolbox? I got nails, I got a saw, I got a drill, I got drywall, I got all kinds of tools. Because it takes more than one tool to accomplish the job. You can't build a house with a hammer. And when we talk about innovation, I think we need to go back and think about what we're really talking about. Innovation isn't just about shiny new objects. It's about embedding a value system that has meaning into our society by making sure that the things we're inventing and the way we're embedding them changes the face of who we are. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the arts represents and what the magic and power it really truly holds. So I like this image because I think it really sums up really clearly how we, we need to think. When we put oil and vinegar together, what happens? They separate. They're two immiscible substances that don't have an easy time coming together. For a long time, we've thought that it's someone else's problem to make sure that creativity becomes mixed up and part of who we really are. And I got news, it's our problem. It's our gift that we've been given. We're the ones who have to mix creativity into everything that we see. We're the ones who have to be the visionaries to create vision and to have the tools and the skill sets to do that, to make sure that it becomes blended together into something that's vibrant. And when I think about doing that, I think that art has to be embedded into business. Every business needs to have a resident artist, artist to work on empathy, to work on um, professionalism, to work on an ethical standard that we can bind ourselves to so that we don't have Enrons and Worldcoms. And I think that every community needs artists in their real estate, into real estate and building communities because we need to have communities that reflect actual real people, not real estate developers with ideas about who the heck they think that community is. And I think that we need to have the arts in cultural diplomacy and national security initiatives. Because the truth of the matter is, it's really hard to hate somebody when you know their family heritage and you know their songs and you know their, their, their standards and their traditions. It's a lot easier to begin a dialogue. And from there, we can start to do business with them. And from doing business with them, we can actually change the world. These are the roles of arts that require mixing things up. And I'm here to ask you to understand that the only way you're ever going to have something that's edible to eat, something that truly will be meaningful to the world, is by shaking it all up. It has to be in every sector and every strand. And each of you embodies a vision of what it can be. Each of you knows something that only you can do because uniquely you isn't systematizable. And our world is so incredibly hungry for that kind of knowledge. And in the end of the day, when we are facing a creativity crisis, since 1958, Alice Torrance has been creating a test to measure adult creativity in children. Since 1993, two years after the World Wide Web was created, it's been in decline. Every single year, creativity has declined. What are we doing sitting on all this creative capital? We are the future of how to change the world. We, need to, we talk about being sidelined. We have sidelined ourselves. Because we don't understand that it's our job to insert ourselves in the process and be that vibrant force that mixes everything up. I want you to join me. I have no passion, as you see. <laughs> I can't contain myself, and I don't know why. This means a lot to me. And I think it means a lot to you, too, because you came here today 
So I'm asking you to join me in innovating through artistry. I'm asking you to embrace the idea that the arts hold a power that is brand new, and that each of us is responsible for making sure that that happens. Thank you.